Okay, so officially let me say welcome to this webinar on the CEDEP MSc in Climate Change and Development. What's going to happen this afternoon is that I'm going to talk you through just a little bit about uh, CEDEP, primarily about the program, or how you might study it, how it works, and take as many questions as we have got time for um, during the course of the afternoon. So I shall just uh, take us on to our first slide and let us get started. Okay, so a um, little bit about CEDEP first. CEDEP is one of three online programs that is postgraduate programs run by SOAS. Uh, we are actually the largest postgraduate online provider within the University of London system. So I think there's more than three and a half thousand students are studying online with SOAS at the moment, of whom slightly more than a thousand study with CEDEP. Uh, and CEDEP has been doing distance learning programs. They weren't originally online um, within the University of London for about 30 years. So we have quite a, a lot of experience of supporting study at distance for, for master's level. So we have this large number of students. Uh, the Climate Change and Development Programme is actually fairly new. We're just in our third study session now. So it's been running for just under 18 months. Um, that and a new MSc Sustainable Development uh, use the teaching model, which I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon. But I say we have this much longer experience of offering uh, distance and line programs in other capacities. So I guess you're uh, all interested in the uh, climate change and development program, at least I hope so. Um, I should say a little bit first actually about myself. I am the program director overall for the CEDEP program. So I've been responsible for bringing this program into being. Uh, but I'm not actually the, the program convener. We're actually between two program conveners at the moment. Uh, we have a new convener for the program starting in a couple of weeks' time, uh, somebody called Dr. Tom Tanner, who has uh, 15 years or so of experience of working in this area, DFID, and then with IDS Sussex. He's currently a research associate at ODI, and he's a brilliant person to head up this program. He happens to be the author of the textbook of our, uh, of our core module, the Climate Change Environment. So really excited that Tom is joining us. But before he starts, I should be able to answer most of your questions on the program. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of the uh, magnitude of the challenge posed by climate change. Uh, and the program is looking at all of those interactions with development processes. Uh, and then we find says this changes everything. Uh, it certainly changes uh, changes a lot. Uh, we have to think about uh, what climate change uh, means for uh, development trajectories in low middle income countries. There. As we adapt to changing climates, what are the implications for the for the nature, <coughs> sorry, nature of development trajectories and the costs of those trajectories? And then conversely, as countries, uh, economies develop, um, we have to think about how to mitigate the impacts of that on climate, what the low carbon development trajectories look like and how are they achieved? Uh, thinking, for example, World Bank estimates that maybe 1.3 billion people still don't have access to electricity. Uh, twice that number rely on traditional biomass cooking and heating. Uh, as people uh, come to rely more on modern electricity, that has its benefits, but it also is going to have huge implications for greenhouse gas emissions as they demand more and more electricity as they come to have a lifestyle more like the ones that, that we have. So how do we get those balances between development and poverty, energy and emissions uh, right? Also, of course, huge uh, international dimensions to this with the interests of 
high income and middle income and low income countries very different in this regard and how do they negotiate um, their relative commitments and responsibilities internationally and how do they uh, work with each other uh, to support development in a changing climate. Okay, so the aims of the programme, in a way I've already uh, covered some of those. Um, what does the challenge of climate change uh, imply for development efforts, development trajectories? Do we have to completely rethink where we're going? Do we have to do what we've conceived of as uh, as development in the past somewhat better? Is it reform or is it revolution? Uh, we want to help students develop analytical skills uh, to address problems of adaptation, uh, but also identifying feasible low carbon development options. So we see that this problem is clearly not going to go away. Uh, and we're looking to contribute to producing the next generation of environment and development professionals working on climate policy and also practice. And um, we hope that this MSc will also uh, provide a route into PhD studies uh, in the same topics for, for some students uh, as well after they finish their MSc. Program like this, uh, it gives you specific academic training. It also uh, helps you with uh, more uh, general professional skills. Uh, and dissertation is a uh, core part of this program, as with uh, most MSCs. So you'll be helped in research design, project management, and literary writing skills. Uh, more generally, uh, MSC level, uh, critical thinking skills are, are, are one of the core skills that we're looking to help students develop. Uh, reflective, independent learning, taking on board complex ideas, thinking your way through them, then being able to communicate them. Uh, all of these are, are skills that we're looking to offer, networking skills um, as well. You can study with SEDEP uh, for three levels of qualification. Uh, a postgraduate certificate is, is the uh, most basic. There are two modules that you have to take for that. Um, if you want to take four modules, but you're not sure that you want to do a research component, you can do a postgraduate diploma. If you want the full MSc with the research component as well, then it's four modules plus a dissertation. Uh, you do, there are two study sessions in a year and you take one module per study session. So that is why we suggest a postgraduate certificate to require at least one year, but you could take up to three if you really were doing it very slowly. Uh, lots of students would like to do an MSc in two years. That is certainly possible within our programs. But when we look at the workload uh, and we know that many of our students are also working um, and have full family lives and other commitments, that you might want to think about a sort of three year time scale. And that just means that within those three years, there are some periods where you think, okay, I'm just too busy at work at the moment. I can't really study intensively over the next two or three months, so I'll take a break. If you have a three-year time frame in mind, that allows you to have uh, a couple of those periods during the course of your studies where you're just less active with your studying. But if you have two years that you can devote intensively to your studies in and around other things, then it's certainly possible to finish the MSc within two years. With SEDEP, uh, you pay as you go. So at the moment, uh, an MSc costs £9,500. Uh, 
there may be small sort of inflation increases in that over over coming years, but it's not going to depart uh, hugely from that figure over over the next two or three years. Um, but you don't pay the full nine thousand five hundred pounds up front. Um, you pay it module by module, and it's five modules, including the uh, dissertation, and those uh, modules are nineteen hundred pounds each. So each time you register for a module, you pay nine hundred pounds. Okay, Hannah, first question: uh, How far in advance do you need to register for a module? Um, good question. So our Study sessions start in the middle of October and the middle of April. And I think it is late September and late March. I think I actually have figures, uh, I have actual dates in my last slide, but sort of broadly late September and late March is when you register for the uh, next study session. So probably only sort of three weeks or so in advance of the study session itself. Um, it says here about scholarships. Um, there are no, well, we have one uh, scholarship uh, specifically for this program for the coming study session, but that's specifically for uh, South African women students. Otherwise, you're in competition for more general scholarships. So there's information on the SOAS page. Um, I would say uh, most of our students are funded either by themselves or by their employers rather than through scholarships. How does a how does a study session work? I said it actually just before I do that. Let me just take the next question. Uh, well, would it be possible to pay all MSc fees at one go? Um, yes, it is perfectly possible to to do that all at one go. If for some reason you have the money and you'd like to pay it all up front, we will certainly uh, we can certainly do that. Um, but actually. You, know, you don't need to do that. You can wait until you've passed particular a particular module and then register for the next one. And actually, I think we'd encourage you to pay as you go, um, just in case something comes up during the course of your MSc uh, and for some reason, whatever, you change your mind. So pay as you go is, is our preferred option. But I'm sure if you want to pay everything up front, we could arrange that. Can you get, uh, George, can you get a student finance loan for the course? Um, yes, UK students can get a, a loan for this. University of London have negotiated with uh, the Office for Students and it's a slightly complicated arrangement for online students and I think that you actually have to pay for the first module yourself as a way of sort of showing that you're actually committed to the program and then you get the money back from the student finance company um, as part of your loan. So I think you have to find a little bit of capital up front but essentially you can then um, get a student, student finance loan for this, for this program. Okay, how does a study session work? So I've said that there are two 16-week study sessions per year, starting in October and April. Um, the one that starts in October does have a two-week break for Christmas. Um, the one that starts in April just goes straight through 16-week flat. Um, we reckon that uh, to complete a module, uh, you should be trying to set aside about 15 hours per week during that study session. So that's quite a significant study commitment if you think about it in terms of available hours in your weekends or evenings or early mornings whenever you whenever you study best. 
And that's the sort of time and commitment that uh, will be necessary to work your way through the materials. Our materials are quite text-based. That is likely to evolve over time, but at the moment they're quite text-based and they comprise two main elements. There are course guides, which have been written by uh, SEDEP staff who are experts in their particular fields. And then those are complemented by a, a series of key readings to read around the topic. Um, you basically do one topic per week uh, for the 16 for the 16 weeks. Um, and all your materials are accessed online via our so-called virtual learning environment. So it's as simple as clicking a link to get to the materials there. Uh, you are in groups of about 15 students on your particular module. Um, if we had 30 students studying a particular module at once, then we would have two tutors. So a dedicated tutor for a group of about 15 students uh, and the tutor's job is to answer your questions and to try and stimulate a discussion uh, during the course of the 16 weeks and during each of the topics that you are studying on. So that's a sort of asynchronous interaction and in that everyone goes on in their own time and contrib contributes to discussion threads. But we find that on uh, these new programs that works very well. As an online student, you have full access to the online resource of the SOAS online library, which uh, are very rich resources for this program. Uh, and so in addition to the key readings uh, that we ask you to read, you are free to go on and uh, look at anything else that you have time to look at. Uh, there are additional readings suggested as sort of options associated with each unit. Um, also, when you're doing your dissertation, obviously you need to be uh, familiar with the South Online Library in order to be getting materials for your dissertation. But there's uh, hundreds and hundreds of journals available to you through the online. Um, each module is assessed via uh, one or two assignments plus an exam. So several of the modules, including the Climate Change and Development Core module, have a, a short initial assignment after about three weeks uh, with, where you uh, reflect critically on a particular reading, you post some comments and then everyone is uh, asked with commenting constructively on a couple of other people's comments, just as a way of getting uh, students familiar with, with uh, debating with each other online. You do get a mark and feedback on that assignment. Uh, there's then a more substantive assignment of, I think, 3,000 words, which comes in week nine of the study session. And then at the end of the study session, so about 10 days after the official end of the study session, there is an exam. And the exam is uh, one bit of the program, which in, one, uh, in some ways is, um, is a bit inflexible, uh, in that you have to go to a designated University of London exam centre to sit the exam. It's a two hour exam, and it's on a specified morning or afternoon. Um, University of London have exam centres in 100 plus countries of the world and they have multiple centres in many countries. So there should be one near you, but it, uh, you do have to be able to turn up on that particular morning or afternoon uh, to take that exam. OK, let's have a look at some of the modules on the uh, Climate Change and Development Programme. Uh, so you'll see that there's one core module. We recommend all students start with that core module, which sort of gives some coverage of the, the breadth of topics within the programme as a whole uh, and showing how they sort of fit together. So uh, you can then take aspects that you've studied in that core module and study them in more depth 
via the list of uh, optional modules. And we require you to take one or more of the uh, list A modules. The slide here is actually not quite correct. You can choose anything from one to three of the list A modules, but you have to do at least one. And then you top that up with modules from list B. So you can choose up to two modules from list B. Each of these modules has been prepared by uh, SOAS staff who you know, have their particular expertise in these areas. Climate change development actually is prepared by uh, a team of us. Uh, climate change adaptation uh, was uh, prepared by our colleague Andy Newsham, who's now in the development studies department here. Um, low carbon development and energy and development uh, were prepared by Dr. Frauke Urban, who is uh, who was the uh, convener of the program at that point, has now moved to Stockholm. Um, I've just finished the Understanding Poverty module, which I'm quite excited about, and I'm about to get started on the Food Security and Social Protection module. Um, our colleague, Professor Lawrence Smith, who's an expert in water catchment management and water management issues, has done the Water and Land Management for Sustainable Development. Um, then we have a couple of modules from our colleague, Dr. Ben Daly, who's also the convener of the MSC Sustainable Development. And in our list, we have one or two modules from other SOAS programs. So the Global Public Policy module is a module that's actually produced by our colleagues uh, in the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy. Um, and their Human and Critical Security module comes from our Development Studies Department. Um, the one module I need to just flag up on the list in front of you is the Gender and Social Inequality module, um, which is probably a year off being ready yet. I'm still uh, finalizing the plans for producing that one. So if that's one of your, the ones you particularly like, it might have to be uh, one of the last ones that you take in your set of choices. For those of you who are interested in doing the full MSc, including the dissertation, let me say a few words about how the dissertation works within this model. So, each year, there are two main study sessions uh, where you should probably be focused on one of the modules I've just shown you. And then in between those sessions, there are little spaces for dissertation study. And so the dissertation is split into four stages. Uh, in the first stage, you think a bit about what makes a good research question and about processes of research and the output at the end of that is that you produce a topic form uh, with some suggested research questions and what you're interested in in doing, doing your dissertation on. And on the basis of that, we then identify a, a suitably qualified supervisor who will then work with you for the rest of your dissertation. And in the second uh, part of your dissertation, they will work with you to take your initial ideas from your topic form and turn those into an assessed proposal, which really sets out what your, the design of your research is. What are the, what's the question that you're interested in and why? What's the gap in the literature you're looking to uh, contribute to filling? Uh, what information might you need to come up with an answer to that question? How will you get it? What will you do with it when you've got it? That's the sort of content of an assessed proposal. And if you can do a good assessed proposal, you're then well set up for the rest of the dissertation. So the assessed proposal carries 20% of the dissertation marks. Um, once you've got your mark and your feedback on that, you're ready to actually do your data gathering, which could be literature based for some students, but for other SEDEP students, as our students are all over the world, it might involve some form of primary data collection. Uh, so you do that in the block three, stage three of the dissertation, and then stage four uh, is the write-up analysis and write-up leading to the submission of the final dissertation. Um, I should have mentioned that when you are in phase two and you are developing the assess proposal. There are also a whole set of research methods 
um, resources that we make available to you and with your supervisor you can identify which ones of those would be useful to you given your topic and the type of data you're working with uh, and, and you can use those materials to help you develop your ideas on what you're going to do in your dissertation. So if you are looking to finish an MSc in two years then you would register for the first stage of the dissertation at the same time as you register for your first module and as soon as you'd finished the 16 weeks of the study session for the first module you'd go into the first stage of the dissertation uh, and if you're if you are going to finish in two years then you have a fairly tight schedule of uh, talk module stage of dissertation talk module stage of dissertation and so on through the two years if you have a three-year time perspective, as I mentioned earlier, you have a couple of breaks in that cycle uh, when you might decide, actually, I'm not time to do any study at all due to other commitments, or you might decide, actually, I'm not going to do a uh, talk module in the next four months, but I'm going to use time to make more progress on my dissertation, take it a bit more at my own pace, um, and uh, just work on it a bit more deeply than I than I can in just the eight to ten weeks of the dissertation stage. So you have a certain amount of, uh, of flexibility as to how quickly you proceed through the program. Okay, I think I've got two or three more slides. Um, this is just a sense of where SEDEP students are located. Um, as I mentioned, we've got over uh, a thousand students and this reflects the whole of the SEDEP student body. Um, we probably have seven, well actually we have precisely 74 students on the climate change and development program at the moment. So we've got just over a thousand on some older uh, programs using a different format which we are still running till 2022. Um, and as you can see, Europe, including UK, which is, accounts for about 20% of our student body, uh, Europe and the UK is just over 50%, and then we've got people spread elsewhere around the world. Our students vary slightly across the programmes that we run, um, but we have, uh, first thing to say is the majority of our students are already in some form of work. We have uh, a very small proportion who have uh, done uh, an undergraduate degree and haven't gone into work yet, but that's less than 5% of our students. Um, probably two thirds to three quarters are already in a job that is related to the subject that they're studying. We have plenty with international organizations, UN, World Bank, we have at least a similar, at least that number or more who are working for a range of NGOs, both international NGOs, national NGOs, and I would say quite a, quite a lot of them are people who are working their way up through um, to their country offices of some international NGO and are seeking to upgrade their skills as, as they progress in their careers. We also have probably, I would say, somewhere a quarter to a third of our students who are coming from a wide variety of backgrounds looking to get into something slightly more development orientated. We have a really pleasing number of people with a sort of pure commercial backgrounds who are looking uh, either to get into understanding, greater understanding of sustainability or perhaps to establish social enterprises, so mixing development expertise. Uh, with, their, with their commercial background. We have quite a lot of people who've got a background uh, in education, maybe teaching, now moving into development, but there are lawyers, there are people from all sorts of backgrounds looking to move into uh, development-oriented professions, as well as those who are already in there. Um, I had a question earlier about when um, you have to enrol. So uh, our next study session starts 16th of April, so about two months away. Uh, it says here that you should have your application uh, put in uh, 
by the 8th of March, you've then got another three weeks or so after that to actually enroll, which involves um, paying, selecting your module and paying your money. If you're starting the program, the selection of module will be the Climate Change and Development Core module, but three weeks or so to pay the money, and then just a couple of weeks after that, the study session will start. Uh, and then after April, the next study session is uh, in the middle of October, so September is the time to get your applications in. Okay, um, I think it's time to open things up to you now and uh, see what questions you, you have for me. I hope that was the sort of information you were looking for, but uh, now please do uh, fire in any questions on anything that you, that you have for me, either things I've covered or things I haven't covered. George, can you give me an example of a dissertation research project? Okay, um, so uh, I guess if uh, you're thinking about a climate change and development uh, MSc, you might therefore uh, focus on what does adaptation mean in a particular area? You might, for example, um, if you were based in a low or middle income country, you might look at some sort of development project and you might examine what the implications of changing climate might be for that project. How do things have to be done differently? You may not look at a project. You may just, if you've got, if you're able to collect primary data, you may uh, look at the livelihoods of people in the area and think about what uh, the changing climate might mean for their for their livelihoods and how they respond to that. Um, that would be a, if you had a primary data collection possibility. Um, if you didn't and you were doing a dissertation that was based on literature, uh, you might take a country that you're interested in and you might in some way critically examine national uh, development strategies and the extent to which climate is thought about in those and what difference it makes for the strategies. Um, if you're somebody who's done the global public policy module, you might also be thinking about what are the drivers of those strategies and what are, what are the politics around embedding consideration of climate more fully into those strategies. Um, Something you could something like that. There's a there's a wide range, uh, as long as there's a focus on both climate and development uh, in your um, in your MS in your dissertation topic. Uh, there's quite a wide range of things that you could think about. Hannah, uh, is it possible to take two modules simultaneously? Um, Right, so I think if you were not working, um, that would certainly be something that could be contemplated. Um, two modules would be something like 30 hours a week. So that would be a lot to do for somebody in a, in a full-time job. So you know, perhaps if you could show you had a part-time job or possibly you were not working for a while, then yes, uh, we certainly wouldn't recommend you to start the program asking to take two modules simultaneously uh, if you hadn't seen how you got on doing one first, unless, as I say, you could show that you were taking time off work to do this. So I would, um, I would go in with the expectation that it really is one module at a time. Um, and then if you really want to make the case to try to, uh, the sorts of things I've talked about are the sorts of things you'd have to try and persuade us of. That makes sense. Okay, great. Val, what mechanism do we have for exams? 
if there's no uh, specific university and country. Um, okay, so the way the exam book, uh, University of London maintain relationships with exam centres in over 100 countries around the world. And as I say, um, there are often multiple exam centres in a given country. Probably the biggest single provider of exam centres is our British Council offices around the world. Um, and they're, um, yeah, so probably more than half of our students are actually doing their exams in British Council exam centres. So the way the system works is um, you have to go to one of the exam centres which is registered with University of London. So there is a list of them on the University of London website and that shows you what your possibilities are. So you select it according to the city you live in. That's probably the biggest single determinant uh, of which exam centre you go to. Um, and, and you take it from the list of options that are available. Um, what I would say is it's very flexible, so you don't have to take all your exams in one centre. So you might take your first exam uh, in a centre uh, in, uh, in Germany, for example, because you're working there, and then you might uh, move to India. So you might find that actually your next couple of exams uh, you are taking in India, and then it may be you end up uh, when it's time for the fourth exam and you're on leave and you're in Dubai and you might take your fourth exam in Dubai. Um, basically, you just register for a center of your choice every time you come to do an exam uh, and they can, they can be all around the world. Okay, um, well, you've asked about Afghanistan. So we do have students in Afghanistan and I am therefore confident that there is a University of London exam centre in, uh, in Kabul. I can't tell you what it is without looking on the in University of London website to look at the list of exam centres, um, but I am almost certain that you would be able to take your exams in country in Afghanistan. George. Um, So you're currently studying geology, uh, particularly enjoying climate change. You're not planning to work next year and instead do a master's full time. Is this the kind of course for you? So uh, let me give you two reflections on that. Um, so the first one is that our modules are essentially social science modules with uh, an element of natural science where necessary to understand the processes involved, but we're really looking at the human interactions around the, uh, around the processes of climate change. So I think in the climate change and development module, there's probably one, maybe two units out of 15, which just give you some of the basics of climate science. Um, and if you were to do the global environmental change module, which is one of the modules uh, in option B, again, there'd be more of the natural science and then some different implications. But much of the program is is social science. So there will be some economics, some politics, um, other things like some anthropology, some law. It's very much a multidisciplinary uh, program, but in the social sciences. So the first thing is to decide uh, if that's really what you want to, to do. Um, we do take people with a variety of backgrounds, so geology background would not be an obstacle to you registering for this program. If you have a 2-1 equivalent uh, in, in your geology, then we would certainly take you on if you decide this is what you wanted to do. Um, if you wanted to do it full time, um, there is still the challenge, the minimum completion time for the MSc is two years. There's a two year cycle for the dissertation. Um, so if you're looking to do a master's in one year and do it full time, you might want to consider an on-campus master's. We really set up to uh, 
um, provide things which work well for people who are studying alongside other things. So hope that's helpful. See Helen's typing, so I'm just waiting for the next question to come in. Um, please feel free to fire in any more questions you have as well. Excuse the pause, I'm watching the chat and expecting a couple of messages to come in at any point. Okay, Hannah, from an admin perspective, are we registered as students like in normal university, i.e. email addresses, etc.? Um, yes, you are. Um, you are registered as a uh, SOAS student, so although ultimately the programme is accredited by University of London and University of London will appear on your degree certificate, the Leeds College of University of London, which provides that study is SOAS and you're therefore a SOAS student with a SOAS email address and password. Um, you will use that for accessing the library, for example. Um, you are welcome, uh, if you have the opportunity, not all our students do, but you're welcome to come uh, to the campus as well and use the, the library facility physically if you want to. Um, there are some students, uh, UK-based students, who can use a scheme called SCONAL, which is a system whereby different universities allow their students to share each other's library facilities. So you get your SCONAL card as a SOAS student and you take it to your the university in the town or city where you live and you present that and then you're able to use their, their library facilities as a visiting student from SOAS. Um, so uh, there are one or two things where SOAS still doesn't quite support its, uh, on, its online students uh, in quite the same way as on campus. Um, so we haven't quite got that level of career support for our students that we have on campus, but these things are gradually being uh, worked on and changed. Uh, and effectively, the distinction between online and on-campus students is uh, being blurred all the time. Uh, and so is working to the, towards the objective of one day offering blended uh, learning where take some modules on campus and some modules at distance. We're not quite there yet, so don't bank on that for this program, but that's our direction of travel, uh, and therefore you will hopefully will feel like a SOA student as if you were here on campus.
still see one message looks like it's on its way to me. Ah, um, oh, brilliant. Okay, hello. Um, so let me see. Your so Helen, you um, you have a background in branding and marketing. Um, you're thinking about uh, how developing a reputation for sustainability uh, can be good for, for the brands that you, you work with. You're particularly interested in uh, climate change with a, a particular interest in energy. Um, and you've noted the similar modules on the MSC Sustainable Development. Um, Okay, uh, so first of all, let me just comment on the uh, MSC Sustainable Development and the Climate Change and Development Program. Uh, you're right, Helen, that there quite a lot of the same modules are offered on both programs. Um, at the moment, if you were doing an MSC in Climate Change and Development as opposed to Sustainable Development, um, the, the two things that would differentiate your degree at the end would be the foundational core module that you take so climate change and development as opposed to understanding sustainable development and then your dissertation in climate change and development that's very much what you know, the dissertation has to focus on something within that area in an MSc in sustainable development it would be a broader range of topics that you might uh, want to take your uh, focus your dissertation on. Um, I think as the programs go on, um, we are looking also to offer additional modules from some of the other programs. In Sarsen, we will be looking to do further differentiation between the programs. But at the moment, it's the it's the foundational core module and the focus of the dissertation, which are the main differentiators between the two programs at the moment. Now, you wanted to know. Um, about if uh, modules will help uh, okay people in the private sector building solutions to tackle climate change challenges so i think it's fair to say that our modules um look at the look at questions of climate change adaptation and mitigation uh, in general terms and then there is scope for people whether they're thinking of it, things from a public policy perspective or from an NGO advocacy perspective or from a, a corporate perspective to take the, that information on the, uh, the challenges of climate change and development and to then start reflecting, what does that mean for me? Um, and tutors will be there to sort of facilitate that discussion. There will certainly be people on the course from all of those backgrounds. So hopefully there'll be the opportunity to bounce ideas um, off other people thinking about things from a similar angle. Um, and then again, when it comes to your dissertation with your supervisor, that's also a very good time to think about it, things particularly from the, from the angles that you're interested in. So there certainly are opportunities through the programme to take the material and digest it from a particular perspective and think, so what does this mean for me? And hopefully within the programme, we will support you to do that. So I hope that that's the best answer I can give to your question. I hope that's helpful. Okay, brilliant. We've had a load of... Uh, okay, great. Another question about carbon credits. Um, to what extent will the modules talk about it? Okay, so uh, they are mentioned in the climate change and development uh, core module. 
um, they don't go into they're not going into in great depth at that point because the core module is introducing the sort of breadth of interest across the program um, I imagine they must therefore be gone into in more depth in the low carbon development module um, but Helen if you wanted to uh, ping me an email I can check that out for you so I, I'm sure the answer is yes that they're, they're addressed actually I'd have to look into those module materials just to uh, absolutely confirm that for you so let me also use this opportunity for everybody here to say if you have uh, questions for me afterwards um, my email address is cp31 at soas.ac.uk and you can also find me on the SEDEP website where my email address um, is also available so that's cp for Colin Poulton cp31 at soas.ac.uk and I'd be very happy to uh, answer any other questions that you have that come up. Great. All right, we've got about five minutes till the, till the hour is up. So um, opportunity if you have any final questions to, to send them in. Um, George, does the program teach us about the UK's climate change and development strategies? So, no, we uh, don't specifically teach about that. Um, what we do in the core module is we think about what the challenge of climate change means uh, for countries at different income levels with different historic emissions uh, and different future aspirations. Um, we think about challenges of uh, no growth or even degrowth uh, for high income countries. Not saying that that's what we have to go for, but we get students to think about what might that mean um, if that was the only way for us to uh, reduce our emissions so that there is still scope for um, economies who historically have emitted far less than us uh, to still fulfill some of their growth aspirations which inevitably will in involve uh, greater emissions than historically. So we do think about the challenges at that sort of level uh, for high income countries. Um, we do inevitably think about uh, development assistance and development finance and I'm, I suspect that comes into the climate change adaptation module and probably the low carbon development and energy and development modules as well so that, that will be possible uh, to think about those sorts of assistance strategies there given that development finance is an important part of the international climate change discussions um, poorer countries saying, um, well, we'd love to go for this low carbon trajectory, um, but you know, where's the money to in, invest in, uh, in renewable energy or the other, other investments that we need to make in, in order to go into a more low carbon trajectory? So development finance is very much uh, featured in the program and again if you have a particular interest in UK's climate change and development strategies that is a valid topic for a dissertation so that's something that you could think about in your dissertation if you particularly wanted to focus on that. Uh, well does the course program link climate change with conflict countries where vulnerability is relatively high? So again yes if you select your uh, options you can think about that in particular so again in the core module um, there is one unit on that uh, the, the nexus between change conflict migration it's definitely something we get our students to think about as um, you know, that's going to be part of future scenarios then if you took the human and critical security optional module which was on the list that I mentioned earlier 
uh, that thinks very much about conflict and um, how climate change interacts with that. So you would have the, uh, the possibility to think about that in more depth through that module. Um, Hannah, are the exams essay based? Um, yes, so the way our exams are structured, Hannah, is that they are two hour exams. Uh, and certainly at the moment, you in the first hour or so, because obviously your time is your own in the exam, uh, you do what, three short questions out of a choice of four. So that tests a bit of your breadth of knowledge and your grasp of key concepts um, that come up in that particular module. And then in uh, the second part of the exam is one longer essay question where you'd be expected to spend roughly an hour on that um, out of a choice of four essays. So basic answer, yes, but one is a longer essay and there are three that are uh, shorter answers. So not essays as such. Um, the assignments, um, I should have said, when I told you about how modules are assessed, where there's an initial exercise after about three weeks, it take, carries 10% of the marks. Um, the, uh, first, the assignment in the middle of the module carries 40% of the marks roughly and the exam the final 50%. So those assignments are 3,000 words. And um, I guess if you haven't got a, a background in writing essays, then your assignments are also opportunities to get practice and good feedback on uh, on writing more essay style things so hopefully that's helpful brilliant okay um we've got to four o'clock um thank you for all of your questions and your engagement i hope you've found that helpful um let me just once again say that if you have further questions that you think of Afterwards, then my email address again is cp31 at soas.ac.uk and I would be very happy uh, to answer any more questions that you have at that point.